Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, 5, and 6 again. Revelation 20, 4, 5, and 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, that thousand years is what we're, we're looking at. It's a period of time coming in the future. It goes by a number of different names in the scriptures. And each of those names is kind of instructive. It tells us a little bit about that time on the earth. It isn't going to be like anything this earth has ever seen up until this point. Obviously, the biggest thing about it is that Jesus Christ will be here personally. Can't even imagine, beyond what the Bible tells us about, what this world is going to be like when the Lord is here personally and there is, and he has absolute, he has absolute sovereignty now. But in the millennium, there is no open resistance to that sovereignty. Right now, man resists that, right? Uh, that's what Stephen said in Acts chapter 7 when he was preaching to the, you know, the council, the Sanhedrin. He said, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. So, but in the millennium, there's no resistance. The resistance, so to speak, has been put down. And, and the Lord is ruling with a rod of iron. And so the nations are going to be under the direct government of Jesus Christ. So we've been looking at some of those names that that period of time is called, and those names kind of help us understand what's going on. We're going to be looking at another one of them tonight. So far, we've looked at the fact that it is called the 1,000-year reign. That give, you know, gives us this idea in Revelation chapter 20. Um, turn back to Jeremiah with me real fast. You don't mind if we jump around a little bit, do you? In our Bible, Jeremiah chapter 23, not jump around in the room, but... We would all mind that, but we're going to jump around in our Bible. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Look at verse number 5 and 6. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Behold, the days come. I want to, I'm going to wait for you to get there. I can still hear pages turning. Jeremiah. Hey, listen. I don't mind when it takes somebody a little bit of time. It's okay. I remember when it took me a long time to find the books of the Bible. <laughs> All right? So I'm not going to rush past you. we got a lot of new Christians in here. So take your time. When you get there, rattle your head. All right, good. Okay, you're there. All right, Jeremiah chapter 23, look at verse number 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David, a descendant of David, in other words, a righteous branch. Look at all the capitals in here. Capital B, branch. That's one of his names. He's called the branch, by the way, four times in the Bible. A righteous branch, a descendant, in other words. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Amen. I think it was Chris Perfetto sent me a picture today. He's, uh, I'm going to read verse 6 in a second too, but, you know, he, he works in the, uh, shoe business and travels around a lot, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Phil today he was in Philadelphia and wherever, you know, so he's constantly like seeing little things, little signs, little posters and things and takes a picture of it and sends, sends it to me with, you know, some kind of a comment. And today was some store in a mall, some clothing store for girls, I guess, called Justice. Anybody ever heard of that? I don't know. Okay, you've heard of it? Some clothing store called Justice. And there was a sign where the store is going to be in the mall. It was just the wall. And on the front of it, it says, New Justice coming soon. 
took a picture of it and said, Amen. <laughs> but it's not going to be a girl's clothing store. <laughs> New justice is coming soon. And he sent me Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. All right, look at it. The king shall reign and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. There isn't going to be any justice, any real justice, until Jesus Christ gets here. There's no true justice until he gets here. But when he comes, that kingdom, that millennial reign of Jesus Christ is going to be a kingdom of justice and righteous judgment. Right? The world's never seen that before. 6,000 years of human history in this earth has never experienced that before. But it's coming soon. And look at verse 6. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. So this is prophecy. Jeremiah is looking ahead to that kingdom, that 1,000-year reign. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. I love that it's all caps. You know what they say when you're texting and you make all caps? What do they normally consider that to be? Like you're shouting, right? Like it's emphatic. It's like the Lord's way of shouting. You know, he got in before anybody knew anything about texting. The Lord just put everything in caps. He's letting you know that's who this righteous king, this judge of all the earth is the Lord our righteousness. I love that verse. Okay, so it's the it's the reign of Jesus Christ. And then go back with me to Acts chapter 3, real fast. This was one of the two of the other names for it, and I want you just to see these. And um, we've referred to them many times, but go to Acts chapter 3. Look at verse number 19. Acts chapter 3. Peter is preaching here in Acts chapter 3. This is right after a big crowd gathered. A crowd of about 5,000 people gathered on the, on the Temple Mount after Peter and John, who had gone up to the temple to pray, there was a, a lame man laying there at the gate of the temple, and you know he asked them for, he was begging, he asked them for alms, and they, that famous reply of theirs, silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus Christ, Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he, he just got healed. He stood up and walked. And so he went leaping and jumping and praising God, and a crowd gathers to see, because they probably all knew this guy. He'd been there maybe for years and years and years. Now they see this guy jumping around. Well, 5,000 people gathered to see what was going on. And Peter, like any good preacher, took advantage of a crowd and just decided to preach. And so he preaches to them. And this is what he says in verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. All right, now, this is obviously not what we would preach today, because you would never tell somebody that if you repent and are converted, then sometime in the future your sins are going to be blotted out. That's not what we tell people. All right, that's not our gospel. But that's what Peter was telling them at the time. Paul had not yet been saved, so that gospel that Jesus Christ gave to Paul for us to preach, they didn't know about it yet. But um, repent ye therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When will their sins be blotted out? When the times of refreshing come. All right, so that times of refreshing is another expression for the millennial kingdom. The thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. The times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus, because that's how the times of refreshing begin, when Jesus Christ returns to earth, that 1,000-year reign, the times when the world is going to be refreshed. Things are going to be made brand new, right? And that will come when Jesus Christ returns. Verse number 21, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. So that's another name for the millennium. All right? It's the times of refreshing. So you can imagine why such a title. Because in the, in, you, know, you read some of the promises in the Old Testament about what the earth is going to be like. The earth is going to be remade. Nature is going to be very different. The climate's going to be different. The sun is going to be different. Everything will be different during the millennial kingdom. And even lifespans are going to be much, 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 much longer than they were in the Old Testament and even today. But... 
So it's go- so times it'll be the times of refreshing. It's going to be the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So it's the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. It's the millennium. It's the times of refreshing. It's the times of restitution. It's also something else. Go with me over to Matthew. Matthew chapter 19. And this will sort of take us into what we're going to teach about tonight. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verse number 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Right? In other words, it would be difficult. It would, he'd just get in by the skin of his teeth. Because sometimes riches, wealth, prosperity get in the way. Uh, it also in one place says that a rich man, it's very difficult for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. But here it's also that it's difficult to get into the kingdom of heaven. And again, he says in verse number 24, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So it looks like one thing that could almost keep a person from ever getting into either one of these two kingdoms, and we're going to talk about these two kingdoms in a second tonight, but is prosperity. So sometimes when people are, don't you see that? When somebody's got it made and everything's going fine and their bills are paid and they're living the dream, most of the time, they're not interested in listening to the gospel. But what happens when somebody's down at the bottom, right? You know what? Sometimes you're willing to hear. You're willing to listen. You're willing to repent. So sometimes God sends trouble, sends somebody a reversal, puts somebody flat on their back for that very reason, because that's sometimes the only way somebody will ever get humbled. And some of you probably experienced it. When everything was going great and you had everything you thought you needed in life, sometimes people don't think they need the Lord very much. But now most people reach out to the Lord when they're in trouble. Not everybody, but most people do. It's not the way God intended it. He intended that the goodness of God would lead you to repentance, but that's not always the way it works. Sometimes it's the severity of God that leads a person to repentance. And uh, which is okay, the Lord will do it either way. It's up to you. <laughs> it's up to you. The goodness of God can lead you to repentance, and if that doesn't work, then God will try severity. And severity is painful. And uh, sometimes prosperity gets in the way of that. And so it's difficult for a rich man, a successful man, to ever get saved. They look down their nose at you. They mock you. you know, they consider Christianity, faith in God, to be a crutch. You don't believe that old Bible, do you? You don't believe that Bible. You're an idiot like somebody called us the other night. Somebody called us an idiot for believing this Bible. You're an idiot. It's a young guy, about 22 years old. My flesh really wanted to handle that conversation completely differently than the way it went. <laughs> but, and I had to apologize to the brothers I was with because I really did get in the flesh and I didn't, didn't really want to discuss doctrine with him. I wanted to just settle this dispute right there and then. But, um, but anyway... But the world does consider you and I idiots for believing this book and for loving God and for just trusting his promises and to set your sights and your hopes on things that you can't even see, just promises in a book, words in a book. That's all I got. Think about it, How to the world, how ridiculous that looks. I got words in a book. That's all I got. But these words in this book changed my life. These words in this book gave me hope. Yeah. You know, then they become more than words. They come off the page and they become faith turns this into the voice of God in your life and the power of God. You know, so anyway, it's but but that's the way the world looks at it. And sometimes success, prosperity, everything going fine for you is going to get in the way of especially young people, you know, having any time for God. So the Lord will. And then it goes on to say when his disciples heard it. Verse 25, they were exceedingly amazed, look at this, saying, who then can be saved? Because, I mean, isn't because they understood people are always working hard and trying and reaching and struggling for success. And it sounds like the Lord is saying that success is going to keep you out of the kingdom of God and keep you out of the kingdom of heaven. Who then can be saved? And the Lord's answer, Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All right, now watch this. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, 
here's Peter. You know, I love Peter. <laughs> No, like, we're not like, I'm not like that, Lord, of course. You know, my prosperity's not going to get in the way of me. Uh, you know, look at me. I have, we have forsaken all and followed thee. He broke his elbow trying to pat himself on the back. What shall we have there for? And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, well, when will the Son of Man sit in the throne of his glory? It's the millennium, times of, ref- times of refreshing, times of restitution, the 1,000-year reign. So here you see another name for it. So the millennial kingdom is called the regeneration, right? The regeneration. What does that tell us about it? Well, let's read the rest of this. It says, In the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Now, we've already said this a couple of times in a row, a couple of Wednesday nights in a row, that obviously you know, you see the difference there, right? Is that our gospel? Now, this is in my Bible, but is that a, is that a promise from the scriptures? For you and me today, right now, is this how you get everlasting life? You have to give up, you have to forsake houses, brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands for his sake? No. You don't, that's not how you get everlasting life. But in the regeneration, the millennium, the kingdom, times of refreshing, times of restitution, there is an element of obedience and faithfulness and sacrifice it may cost you tremendously to have eternal life in, the, in that kingdom, all right? That's not, the, that's not true of us right now. This is where the Bible says, study to show yourselves approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. What does it say? Rightly dividing the word of truth, right? Properly separating, distinguishing the things in the word of truth that are not exactly the same, right? Things that are not identical are not the same, all right? So you look for things are different. Why is that not the message for the church today? It's important to understand that. All right, so let's go back and look at this for just a second. The regeneration. Well, to get an idea, uh, keep your finger there because we're going to come back to this chapter. Just go over to Titus chapter 3 because that word regeneration is only found in the Bible twice. And Titus chapter 3 is where is the other place where it's used. Titus chapter 3, just before the book of Hebrews, toward the end of your New Testament. Sm- small little book. This is one of those pastoral epistles. This was written to a pastor. Verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. Amen. Disobedient. Mm-hmm. Deceived. That's right. Serving. Diverse, that means all kinds. Diverse lusts and pleasure, like serving it, right? Like a a servant labors for a master. These things, many, many times, these things master men and women's lives. These desires, lusts, not always, you know, sometimes a lust can be for food, for money, for success, for power. The children of Israel lusted for meat in the wilderness, they just wanted meat, and God gave them meat until it came out, came out of their nostrils. So, but sometimes people's lives are dominated and controlled by these lusts, and we were all pretty much there at one time. It says we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hateful and hating one another. That sort of sums up the life of the lost man, right? It says, and I love that verse 4 starts out with but. Amen? But after that, the the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. In the worst of man's condition, Jesus Christ appeared on this earth, right? The grace of God, which bringeth salvation, hath appeared unto all men. He appeared. There he came, you know. 
And he came, and many times he appeared in our lives right at the very worst point. I don't know about you, but he did for me. It, you know, He didn't appear in my life when I was on a mountaintop. He appeared in my life when I was as far down, I guess, as I can look back, and it's as far down as I ever was in my life, in a deep, dark valley, a crisis of my own making. I did it to myself. But in that moment, the Lord appeared. I don't mean I saw him with my eyes, but he stepped into the situation and made his presence known. And for the first time in my life, I had a conversation with him. I had a, I had a conversation with him. And I found out that he listened and something happened and changed inside of me. So he appeared, right? And here it says, But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he hath, mercy, he saved us. And here it is, by the washing of regeneration, to regenerate means to put life into something that had no life, right? Right? To put power where there was no power. When we were yet without strength, right? Without strength in due time. It doesn't say when we had a little bit of strength in our life. No, when we were without strength. To regenerate. Generate means life. It has to do like in the old in the old testament when it talks about the generations of Adam. It means the lives that came from Adam, like the descendants. Adam and Eve had children, and those children had children, and those children had children, and lives, you know, the earth was populated because of Adam and Eve. So there was life that was put into the earth, and the Bible speaks about the generations of Adam, right? Born, the people that were born to Adam physically. And so to regenerate means to put life back in there. So regeneration means the power of the Holy Spirit of God taking something that was dead, that's what we were, dead in trespasses and sins, and the Holy Spirit of God comes in and puts life where there was no life. All right? That's regeneration, and then there's life. Right? And that regeneration does more than just put life there. It cleanses the old life away. It washes. There's a washing that takes place with regeneration. So there's a, the, not only does the Holy Spirit of God come in and put life in us when we got saved, but he cleanses us at the same time. So there's the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit takes his place where he was supposed to be from the beginning of time. Right? He, when Adam was first created, God breathed his own breath from his mouth into Adam. I believe that was the Holy Spirit of God. Because in the upper room, when Jesus breathed on his disciples, he said to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And he breathed on them. And that's what he did in the Garden of Eden when he breathed into Adam, and Adam became a living soul. God had breathed his own spirit into that pile of dirt. And you know what? It happened to you the day you got saved. (laughs) Just a pile of dirt, right? A pile of dirt going through life, doing, you know, making your mark, but still, no matter what's accomplished, just a pile of dirt. And at the end, you breathe your last breath and you go back to dirt, right? But what happened the day you got saved? The Holy Ghost was breathed into you. You became a, a living, a true, living, eternal soul. And that's regeneration, right? So, but that's talking about personal regeneration. In, back in Matthew, it's the only two times the word is used. In Titus, it's talking about personal, inward. What got regenerated? Your body when you got saved? No, no, no. It was inward, internal, right? Something inside that was dead is brought to life. Jesus called it in John chapter 3, being born again, right? Brought to life. So something inside is regenerated. But in Matthew chapter 19, he's not talking about personal regeneration. He's talking about planetary regeneration. It's not inward. It's, it's the natural world is regenerated. Because sin has affected both, right? Sin affected the man's soul. It killed it. But remember that curse also affected the earth, right? The earth has been affected by sin. Everything you see has been touched by the law of sin and death. And so the earth is going to be regenerated as well as you were regenerated personally, inwardly. But the kingdom... The, this, this millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ is when the earth is going to be regenerated. I mean, 
Imagine the transformation that came to you the day you got saved. Now, just imagine that on a planetary scale. What happens to this earth in the generation, in the regeneration? So that's another word for it. But if you go back to Matthew chapter 19, there's a couple of things in here that just um, sort of require us to make some comments here. I can't pass over these things. In the regeneration, in, in the regeneration, in the context here, Jesus mentions both kingdoms, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. We'll look at that in a second. But then, so both kingdoms are in the regeneration. So in the millennial kingdom, I forgot one of those. The other thing that it's called is the world to come, which we spent several weeks on. So you've got the millennial kingdom, the times of refreshing, times of restitution, the regeneration, the world to come, all speaking about the exact same period of time. The same period of time on the earth when Jesus Christ is here and he's running the world in person. All right. Now, in this context, we see verse 23 and 24, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are both mentioned in that context. So the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are going to be in the millennium. It is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God in their very best state. All right. Uh, Remember when Jesus Christ began preaching, when his earthly ministry began in the book of Matthew, he begins by saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in the other Gospels, you hear him say, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So throughout the Gospels, Matthew mentions the kingdom of heaven much more than it does the kingdom of God. And Luke and Mark and Luke and John don't even mention the kingdom of heaven. They only mention the kingdom of God. So that sort of tells you that the kingdom of heaven is in a peculiar way, since it's only mentioned in the book of Matthew, which is most definitely the gospel for the Jewish people, that the kingdom of heaven primarily has the nation of Israel at its center. It is, so I want to talk a little bit about that because the millennium is also the kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom that Jesus Christ promised when he began preaching. Now, he said it was at hand. That means, you know, how far is your hand away from you? It's near. It's right here, ready to to be given to you. And the children of Israel were being offered it during the Lord's ministry on the earth. He was preaching to them. And he told them the kingdom of God was at hand. He told them that they had to seek first the kingdom of God. And then all these things that they were striving for would, would be added unto them. So the millennium is also the kingdom of heaven. It, and we wanna, I just want to focus on that for just a second tonight. The kingdom of heaven. Well, if you've been in our church for any period of time, you know that there's a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. A very, very important difference. Many people don't make the distinction. But there are two different kingdoms mentioned in the Bible. All right, let's talk about the kingdom of God very briefly. First of all, Romans chapter 14 says that the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. All right, so those are not material things. None of those things are material things. It doesn't say the kingdom of the kingdom of God is a bigger house, a nicer car, more money. Those are all spiritual things, right? Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. In the book of Luke, chapter 17, verse 20 and 21, it says, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. So it's not something that you can see. When you got saved, the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, moved into you. Right? He moved inside of your body. And he set up a little kingdom inside your heart, in you. And inside you is that kingdom. And the Lord went on in Luke chapter 17, verse 21. He said to the Pharisees, Neither say they, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. All right, now the kingdom of heaven is never spoken of as being in you. That would be very weird once you find out what the kingdom of heaven is. But the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, right? And the kingdom of God is in you, right? In another place, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 50, it says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So it's not a fleshly kingdom. It's something, obviously, if it's something that comes inside of you the moment you got saved, then 
it's, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's not a physical thing, right? Um, the kingdom of God in the scriptures relates primarily throughout the Gospels and throughout all Paul's letters, relates primarily to those that are born again, to the sons of God, to the church. Paul speaks about the kingdom of God. He never mentions the kingdom of heaven, not once. But he speaks about the kingdom of God a number of times, and that relates to us, to the church, because it's a spiritual kingdom. Jesus said, even said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he said, you cannot, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Right? Um, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. It was a an amazing thing, something Nicodemus had never heard. It wasn't anything that was actually happening to people at that time because the Holy Ghost wasn't even yet given until after the day of Pentecost. But the Lord was prophesying what would be coming, that people would be born again. And without that new birth, you couldn't, you couldn't see the kingdom of God. Um, Jesus said in another place, in Matthew chapter 12, in verse 28, he said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God then the kingdom of God is come unto you. That's a strange statement. But the kingdom of God begins when the Holy Spirit of God kicks somebody out. Amen? Because there was somebody running the show in you before you got saved. The Bible says, Ephesians chapter 2, it speaks about that spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now, you might not want to admit it, and you may not recognize it. You don't want to be honest sometimes about this. But before you got saved, you were under the control of an evil spirit. That's what the Bible says. It says that. What happened? Well, those two spirits can't live in you at the same time. When the Holy Spirit of God came in, guess what happened? He had to kick that other spirit out. So somebody took up residence inside of you, and then if I'll let the Holy Spirit of God have control of me, then all that power that he has is available to us. It works in our life. All right? and, this, and the devil is always, he's been kicked out, and he can never get back in once you're saved. But he can just whisper in your ears, and he can haunt you and torment you and lie to you and, and, and try to discourage you and seduce you. But he has to do that from the outside. But you know what? Your ears work and you, you know, your spirit can pick that up. But you got to remember, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So the, he's out there. Somebody else is in here. All right. So that verse is talking about the kingdom of God. The Lord casts out devils by the spirit of God and then the kingdom of God comes unto you. So the kingdom of God is spiritual. Another another verse, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12 and 13 says this, giving thanks unto the Father who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. All right, so that's where the church is. The church is a part of that kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of God. Okay, so if the kingdom of God is spiritual, if the kingdom of God does not come with observation. If the kingdom of God is inside of you, then what's the deal with the kingdom of heaven? If the kingdom of God is spiritual, what's the kingdom of heaven? Physical. All right? If the kingdom of God is invisible, then what's the kingdom of heaven? Visible. Okay? If the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, then it makes sense when Jesus said concerning the kingdom of heaven that the violent take it by force. Wow. I'm glad the Lord doesn't speak about violence associated with the kingdom of God, but he speaks about violence associated with the kingdom of heaven. You know why? You read the book of Revelation. We read it in Revelation chapter 19. When the king of that kingdom returns, he's not coming back with uh, to, to reason and to have a conversation with the world. He's coming back, and from heaven his garments are already... His vesture is already dipped in blood. He's coming back to make war, to judge and to make war. There's no conversation here. There's no, there's no parlay. <laughs> it's just bloodshed. All right? So the kingdom of heaven comes in with violence. It begins with violence. Not on our part. I don't think we're going to be participating in that violence, but we're going to be 
riding right behind the one who has that sword that goes out of his mouth and slays the wicked. So the kingdom of the, the, the millennial kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom of heaven. It's the government of heaven established on the earth. It's the rules of heaven established on this planet. It's the king of heaven running the show down here now. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why that's not a prayer for the New Testament church. You and I don't pray the Lord's prayer. That's, you're not praying for that kingdom to come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will. Now, some of that applies to us, but we're not praying for the kingdom to come. When you got saved, the kingdom came inside of you, and before that kingdom ever comes, you're going up there getting ready to come back with it. So, anyway. So, the kingdom of heaven. Now, here's the kingdom of heaven. We read Jeremiah chapter 23. That's the kingdom, that's the king of that kingdom, right? A king shall reign in righteousness. All right, he's going to execute, uh, execute justice. Judgment and justice in the earth. And his name is the Lord our righteousness. That's the king of that kingdom. Jeremiah, uh, Genesis chapter 49 verse 10 says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, and sh- until Shiloh come, that's the king of that kingdom, until Shiloh come, and the gathering of the, and unto him shall be the gathering of the people. So when the king of that kingdom comes, he'll gather the people around him. In uh, Ezekiel chapter 21 and verse number 27, it's, Ezekiel was a prophet that lived and prophesied right at the end of the, the, the lineage of the Davidic kings in the Old Testament. All those sons of David, the descendants of David that ruled Judah, that long line of kings, uh, I guess 20, 19, 20 kings in that line, And then eventually it all came to an end. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. And Judah went into captivity. And at that, Ezekiel was alive for that. And Ezekiel said at that time, he said this in chapter 21 and verse 27. God was speaking through Ezekiel. He said, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. He's talking about the kingdom. The kingdom of Israel. The kingdom of Judah under those descendants of David. Now, God had made a promise that a, a descendant of David would sit upon the throne forever. But there came a point when that lineage ended because of sin. And the only way that lineage could be continued was in the life and in the person of Jesus Christ. He was, that's why he was called the son of David. And he sat upon in the, in the, in the gospel when the angels sang about his coming, he said he would sit upon the throne of David. All right? But at the time... And when Ezekiel was alive, he said, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. It shall be no more. The Old Testament kingdom of heaven, when God was governing the earth, governing Israel at least, through those kings, he was controlling his people through those kings that descended from David. He said, it shall be no more until he come whose right it is. Until he come whose right it is. Now, you know who that one that would come one day, whose right it is? Jesus Christ. That's the one that Ezekiel's talking about. And that was written, I don't know, that's probably, that's the, so that's probably 600 B.C. So what do we look at, 2,600 years ago? Ezekiel said that line of David ends until the one comes whose right it is. And Jesus Christ has the right to govern the kingdom of heaven, and he is coming. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 said it this way, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, who is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. He is that king that is going to reign in Israel. The kingdom of heaven. And the Bible says uh, in the book of Revelation, look at, um, look at Revelation. Turn back there with me to Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> we didn't get very far with this tonight, and i got to stop. We're not going to have any time to pray. We're going to stop here. We barely got begun. Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> I guess we'll continue the next time then when we're on this, uh, on this subject. We're going to look at 
how the millennial kingdom is the kingdom of heaven fulfilled. And the Bible tells us a lot about the kingdom of heaven, what it's going to be like. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 give the, give the rules by which the kingdom is going to be governed. Jesus Christ sat on the mount, the Sermon on the Mount, they call it. And he speaks about what it will be like in the kingdom of heaven. So those are the rules. Those three chapters are basically the constitution of the king. That's the government of the millennium. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, he gives you a bunch of... That's where the parables of the kingdom of heaven begin in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 21, he talks about the nation of Israel being excluded, some being excluded from the kingdom of heaven, and that others coming to sit down in the kingdom of heaven with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. All right, so the Bible speaks an awful lot about that kingdom. But here it is in Revelation chapter 11. Look at verse number 14. Revelation chapter 11 is describing the events right at the end of the tribulation. Chapter 11, verse 14 and 15, it says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly, and the seventh angel sounded. All right, so you know when you come to the seventh, that's normally the end of something, right? Seventh day, you've come to the end of your week. Bible, in the Bible, God always counts in sevens. So the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials, all tell the same subsequent story, and every one of those, the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, the seventh vial, all describe the exact same event. It's just the Lord's way of explaining the tribulation to us in several different ways. Just like he gave you four Gospels to explain the life of Jesus Christ in a number of different ways. And the Revelation is also described in a number of different ways. First, he takes us through it in the form of four, seven seals. When you get to the seventh seal, uh, there's still a lot of the Revel book of Revelation left, but the seventh seal is actually right at the end of the tribulation. Then he tells you the story all over again with seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet is also the end of the tribulation. And then he starts over and tells you the story again with seven vials. And the seventh vial is also the end of the tribulation. So if you combine those things, if you study the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh vial, you know what you're looking at? You're looking at the exact same moment in time. That moment, right at the end of the tribulation, maybe even in the last, it looks to me like it's the last 30 minutes of the tribulation. It looks like the last 30 minutes, because we won't go into that, but Revelation Chapter 8, verse 1, speaks about there being silence in heaven for 30 minutes. The last seal is only 30 minutes long. So that means right here at the end, the last seal, last trumpet, last vial, same moment in time. Now look at this. It says, And the seventh angel sounded. Here comes the seventh trumpet. And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So God has given all the kings of this earth 6,000 years to mess this up. And Jesus Christ is going to come and he's taking control of all those kingdoms. All the kingdoms of this world in those, la in those last moments of the tribulation, when the skies open and Jesus Christ comes down, all the kingdoms of this earth revert back to Jesus Christ. They all become his again. Right? It says, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, you're not at the end of the book of Revelation, but right there you're at the end of the tribulation. All right? And then the Lord describes it another way, and then he describes it another way, so that you could see it, so you could get it. And that's exactly why we have four Gospels, so you could look at the life of Jesus Christ from four perspectives. And the book of Revelation gives you the exact same thing, four perspectives of the same period of time, that, that great time of wrath and tribulation. Uh, let's go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. <clears throat> Speaking about that wonder that John sees in heaven, this woman, um, and we're not going to go into that right now, of what this represents. There's a lot of curiosity and a lot of speculation as to what this is right now, especially right now on the Internet. But we're not talking about we're not going to talk about what this woman and everything that she represents, but in general, this represents the nation of Israel. And it says concerning this nation, this woman, 
She brought forth, verse 5, she brought forth a man child. Jesus Christ was a Jew, came unto his own, right? He was born in Israel, born of a virgin. This, and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's the, that's the, that's the birth of the king, all right? So Jesus Christ would be coming and all the kingdoms of this world would revert to him. And then Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15 says this, and we'll stop right there. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. So the kingdom of heaven comes in with violence. The kingdom of heaven comes in with a warrior king. The kingdom of heaven comes in with a... That king is carrying a rod of iron, right? When he came here the first time during his earthly ministry, he says, it says of him that a bruised reed would he not break. That's how gentle he would be. Smoking flax would he not quench. I mean, the Lord in his earthly ministry in that first three and a half years was, was gentle, kind. But the second time he comes... He's coming as a king. He's coming back as that lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming back to conquer. And that's the kingdom of heaven. He didn't come in that way when he saved you. The kingdom of heaven didn't come in that way, did it? He didn't come in as like a conquering hero, mowing you down. He didn't come in with violence. He came in as your savior. But when that kingdom of heaven gets established on this earth, man, I'm glad we have front row seats. You know that? you got a front row seat for that. You're going up in the rapture and you're coming back. You're going to be right looking over his shoulder as we're coming down out of heaven when the Lord sets that thing up. It's going to be some time. So we'll continue this next time. We're going to look at some of the things that the Bible says are going to take place in the kingdom of heaven when uh, the Lord reigns on this earth. We'll finish it next time, okay? All right. What you're reading here, you're going to see it happen in front of your eyes. You're going to see it happen.